Hi, and thanks for joining us for Mastering the Next Generation of Kentucky Science Standards. My name is Francis Fidgen. In the next hour, we'll be taking a look at a bit of what makes the new Next Generation Science Standards tougher, how those new standards link to Common Core, ELA, and math, and how those uh, changes are affecting the methods for science instruction K through 12. Beyond science and engineering itself, we're also going to take a look at how science and engineering practices and the higher order thinking skills that we're developing in students through these new next generation science standards uh, integrate with other areas of the curriculum as well, specifically art. To give you a little bit of background on myself, I'm CEO here at NoAdam. I helped co-found the company about 10 years ago and have a bit of a background in teaching myself, spending about eight years as a teacher uh, in high school as well as elementary and middle school uh, STEM settings where uh, really the focus of what we do and uh, as well as my work as a teacher was really to focus on higher order thinking, to uh, focus on the creative, evaluative, and analytical thinking skills which are really vital no matter what college or career choice a student makes. Uh, those higher order thinking skills prepare students to participate uh, in any discipline, support STEM industry or not in their career. Uh, it helps them to be scientific liter scientifically literate. It helps them to um, really consider communication carefully, no matter if it's marketing for a product they're buying or um, you know, their role as a scientist or engineer someday. So when you think about higher order thinking, uh, those creative, evaluative, and analytical thinking skills are best applied, at least that's what we believe here at NOATOM, in the STEM disciplines uh, within the K-12 setting. So they're a part of music class, they're a part of uh, English class and math class, but we can really teach those higher order thinking skills in a very unique way when we have uh, science time on learning because we can make it project-based, we can make it hands-on. We can actually put students in the role of scientist and engineer. And that's one of the key shifts under these standards. The idea that students are engaged as scientists and engineer, engineers, but they're not only hands-on but minds-on, uh, working from problem to an evidence-based solution or working from a question through their own hypothesis uh, to an evidence-based answer. And so those shifts are really what is presenting folks with a lot of changes right now, and in some cases difficulty. Um, it's, a dif it's difficult for testing, as you've seen in Kentucky, and uh, testing not being sort of ready and available uh, according to the timeline that was initially uh, anticipated by the Department of Education in Kentucky. But furthermore, it's a, a real challenge for creating lesson plans and for creating um, an experience in the classroom that is engaging the expectations or students in the expectations of these new uh, standards. So let's take a little look at that. So thinking, you know, from the standpoint of where Kentucky is at now, so the goals for this year really for most districts is a transitioning curriculum and instruction to reflect the performance expectations and the three dimensions of the next generation science standards. Other things that are going on this year, uh, and you know, both of these are going to be part of you know, multiple years into the future as well because uh, this process is not sort of a quick or easy thing to do. Uh, the other thing that's in progress right now is the alignment of assessments, both classroom assessments as well as standardized assessments to be able to um, measure the results of instruction in terms of student learning. And so uh, I have a few examples of next generation science standardized uh, assessments to show you but from other states, but also um, there, I have some examples that I'll show you that kind of 
perhaps help you understand what a classroom assessment should look like as well, because the difference between a standardized assessment and a classroom assessment really uh, is, you know, shouldn't be any different. Uh, historically, there were differences, but those differences are going away. The, the two should really merge and be very similar, and I'll show you what that looks like. So, one of the things as Kentucky educators are wrestling with, you know, okay, how do I uh, actually, you know, what what curriculum do I have? How do I create curriculum? What should that curriculum look like? Uh, educators are turning to the standards and the Department of Education has made mapping cards available. And I just want to point out that mapping is about 3% of the work of actually uh, creating curriculum under these new standards. Um, these mapping cards, by the way, I, I want to point out that they're problematic. Um, and this is, it, they actually display one of the great issues that's not just a Kentucky issue, it's happening uh, in West Virginia, it's happening in a number of other states where folks are kind of under the impression that the performance expectation is like the standards they used to have. If they can kind of find some curriculum that they have that's close to that performance expectation, then what they can do is somehow add some practices to it and, you know, cover those or do those, and that's going to be sufficient. Uh, the new standards aren't designed for that that type of environment that could, they can kind of just be dropped into something. The new standards are actually a system of standards. They are uh, performance expectations because a student is going to be expected to be able to perform that expectation in a novel context. Novel context meaning one that is not the result of direct instruction. And so that context is actually created uh, in three dimensions, not just literally, but figuratively, um, because the next generation science standards are three dimensional. Now, when you look at these, and these are the actual uh, science curriculum mapping cards that are being offered by the Kentucky Department of Education at uh, the department's website, I wanted to point out that these standards aren't even labeled in terms of their uh, identifying sort of standard uh, nomenclature, you know, um, something that is, you know, LS5-1 or 5-LS-1 kind of thing. And th there's a reason that that's important because uh, these are fifth grade standards, but what's missing from them are those foundations. And so in order for you to really understand what a standard like this, where I've got the arrow pointing to, the standard develop a model to describe the movement of matter among plants, animals, decomposers, and the environment. Um, to understand that, you need to understand the three dimensions of that standard, as well as the clarification statement. This is how that standard should appear. You see there's an awful lot more to it. That's why this is the original NGSS version of that standard. And the, in order to make these little mapping cards, all of that has been stripped away. But in fact, in order to map it, you need this information. So you either have to know it, which is unlikely because the sheer volume to just be able to recall uh, you know, all of the foundations because they, they vary by standard. You need to be able to dial back from this standard to its documentation in the next generation science standards themselves, which the department does provide all of these links, but it's not a link necessarily between the cards they're offering and what people may be incorporating into their mapping efforts and the documentation itself. So, so that's why it's problematic. It's, it's problematic if you don't know and recognize and integrate uh, all of what that standard entails. So I want to explain what what, that, what I mean by that. So that, this is the same exact standard, by the way. So what I'm pointing to here, this standard, is literally this standard here. See how it's labeled 5-LS2-1? So, and they're even saying students who demonstrate understanding can develop a model. So that is what their student is going to be expected to be able to perform. Now, there's clarification statements around that which help to um, 
clarify what the emphasis, the emphasis is as well as what the assessment boundaries are. So in this case, you might be thinking microbiomes, you're thinking ecosystems, you're thinking you know, um, uh, food chains and food webs and so on. So you can see that they're offering this assessment boundary that the assessment does not include molecular explanations. So if you're thinking about microbiomes, depending on you know, the level of that scale of microbiome that you're digging into, uh, you could be thinking on a molecular level, but that's beyond the scope of what the expectation of the standard is. So that's the purpose of the assessment boundary. Clarification statement and uh, you know the purpose of that is to help clarify that when we're talking about a model we are talking about uh, the idea of food chains and food webs but that there's within food matter which is not consumed. Um, and so that matter being kind of passed between links in a food chain or food web and uh, how each link is basically presenting food for the next link. So that's why this clarification statement exists. It's, you know, in, a very, in, in two very simple statements here, there's an awful lot of value added. Now, I mentioned that you know, here's, a, here's a standard in its pieces. Well, when you are creating curriculum, and lessons and thinking about that classroom environment, you have to be thinking about the three dimensions, which is what you see below the standard. And these are elements of the three dimensions which are directly uh, sort of attached to this standard. So you can expect when a student is going to by a standardized assessment that that assessment is going to require the student to have these three dimensions at you know at their disposal have knowledge and proficiency of in them so the dimensions themselves the science and engineering practices which you see in blue here those are the skills specific to science and engineering now in this case in order to develop a model it's going to be expected that a student is able to develop a model that describes phenomena so you can imagine the transfer of matter or energy in a food chain or food web is a type of phenomena that we can observe in our environment uh, in, eco in ecosystems. Another practice is modeling uh, laws, mechanisms, theories, explaining natural phenomena through um, being able to give an explanation that describes the mechanism for a natural event. So a mechanism for a natural event might be something like decomposers within a food chain or food web who recycle matter into the environment when something dies. For instance, if a minnow in a pond dies, then bacteria will convert the matter in that minnow back into matter which is available for algae or other organisms to uptake and bring back into that food chain or food web. So that is what it means to describe um, the mechanisms for natural events. So within food chains we have life cycles and within a life cycle we actually have food chains and food webs. Um, and, and these things are dynamic. Not all life cycles are the same, not all food chains are the same, not all organisms are the same. The, that comes into play because these practices are skills that are used to develop and use the disciplinary core ideas which are the content sort of core of these standards. So here you see that the content in, that is related to developing a model that describes the movement of matter among plants, animals, and decomposers has to do with the relationship, their interdependent relationships in ecosystems. So you can see here that the food of almost any kind of organism can be traced back to plants with the idea that energy is coming to us from the sun and so on. And that there are roles that uh, organisms play in terms of uh, producing, consuming, decomposing, and so on. And uh, that that is um, you know, a synergistic kind of cycle. So the idea that it's a cycle and that it's an ecosystem uh, that can be described in all these sort of parts, the idea of a decomposer, a producer, a consumer, um, and how plants and animals sort of fit into those broad titles and how there's this sort of natural uh, recycling and restoration process is 
a systems model, and that's where cross-cutting concepts come in. Cross-cutting concepts um, are all about the system nature of phenomena, the, the way that uh, phenomena can um, act as a cycle, uh, that inputs and outputs in different aspects of a system have you know, affect how the elements of that system operate. And so in this case, they are looking for students to be able to look at something like an ecosystem and describe it in terms of its components and how those components interact. So again, back to that idea of the pond and the, the food chains and food webs and, and things like this. A, a student as a result of the classroom instruction that they have received and the environment that's been created through curriculum is going to need to be able to um, look at the pond and use their skills, their science and engineering practice skills, to extract meaning out of what they're seeing in terms of the content itself, actually identifying ecosystems, and then be able to describe those ecos ecosystems in terms of the parts, so the specific plants, animals, and their roles that they play. And I'm not talking about sort of the Latin definition of a particular flower or tree species. I mean that they're going to be able to look at sort of the characteristics of an animal and say, oh, you know, um, this would be a herbivore or a carnivore. Um, this is a consumer. Look at a plant and identify it as a producer and be able to orient those parts into a system and describe how they interact and then be able to take it a, a bit further as well in terms of thinking about what the implications of removing one of these elements of an ecosystem or um, increasing the population of certain uh, consumers. What impact on the ecosystem would that have? Uh, and so that's where you start to see things like input, output, and uh, you know something that's much more dynamic than the traditional standards and assessments would um, have otherwise expected in the past. So this brings to the forefront that the next generation science standards are built on the nature of science and engineering itself. And actually, the documentation for the next generation science standards gives us a definition for science and engineering and helps us understand that there is a STEM cycle, a science, technology, engineering, and math kind of cycle that occurs, a synergy that's there. So science is knowledge from experimentation. Scientists ask questions. And they answer those questions by developing hypothetical answers and testing them by planning, developing plans for investigations, which yield data. And that data is then analyzed by the scientist and used to support a conclusion about what they thought would be an answer potentially to that question. And, and that's how knowledge is extended through science. That's what scientific knowledge is. Scientific knowledge is knowledge from experimentation. Engineers, on the other hand, they solve problems. They identify problems and they solve them by using their scientific knowledge and conceiving of potential solutions, which they prototype. And they create those prototypes and test them. They test them with some procedure. And that test yields data. And that data is then analyzed and useful for reflecting on whether or not the proposed solution that they prototyped actually solves the problem. So that's where both science and engineering come to evidence-based conclusions. However, you know, the tool set is common between each. The practices are common. However, the processes are different. So, and I want to just point out here that science and engineering both disciplines, neither is linear. Um, when you don't know something, when you're extending knowledge, when you're developing a new technology that doesn't exist, um, you're, you are venturing into the unknown. And that is, by its very nature, something that cannot be prescribed. It is nonlinear. Um, it is, to some degree, unpredictable. However, the role of the scientific process and the role of the engineering design process is 
to provide or really represents a logical um, method or a logical process for going from a question or a problem to an evidence-based conclusion. So both pra practices and processes are necessary. Now, if you're familiar with writing and the English language arts um, approach that we take, especially in elementary school and even into middle school and so on, we teach children writing practices, word choice, voice, tone, all of these things are examples of writing practices. We also teach children the writing process. Now, the writing process, or a writing process, is brainstorming, pre-writing, drafting, maybe peer editing, peer, re peer review and peer editing, then uh, incorporating that critique into something that may go through another set of you know edits and so on until finally you have a high quality work that you can publish as an author. So that process requires the word choice and voice and tone practices, but it serves an entirely different purpose. So when you think about the scientific process and the engineering design process, you have to understand that those are processes that serve a specific purpose in helping scientists or students uh, as scientists move from an, a, a question to an evidence-based solution or from a problem to an evidence-based um, solution. So, so I want to point that out because there are people who have not thought deeply enough about this and tend to um, say, you know, kind of, uh, you know, there's no process to science or engineering and it's really quite the opposite. If you engage uh, any STEM industry, um, you will very quickly learn that there are many, many processes that are in place that usher that company from idea generation to the point of evidence-based conclusions and action items and actual technology which becomes scalable. Um, it's documented, it's logical, and it's methodical. That's the way the world works. But the, the, and I just mentioned it here, is that engineers, the result of their prototyping and their testing when something actually solves a problem, that is then technology. And so engineers are not only building things. Um, and actually, engineers are not only designing physical things. The engineers don't really build things. Um, you know, you go to a construction site where a house is being built. Um, you know, most likely you're not going to find an engineer. You might find one for a day or two, um, but most days there's no engineers there. And the reason for that is that engineers are there to solve problems with their knowledge of science, and they do that by designing technology. So um, prototyping, and then once that prototype is ready to scale, that is the technology that solves the problem. So, so it forms a kind of cycle uh, like this because the technology enables scientists to ask new questions, sort of exposes new areas of interest. Uh, it also helps them answer questions that they couldn't answer previously, and we see this a lot with things like space probes. Scientists have questions about planets where we can't collect data until there's a space probe with sensors that can actually collect that data, and that probe needs to be engineered to solve the problem of collecting the data. So, um, so that's kind of a, a little example of how engineers help scientists, and then also scientists help engineers by, you know, developing new knowledge about things like plastics and, and po you know, different polymers, different nano um, materials, and so on. You see math in the center because math is the tool for communication among scientists among engineers and between them. And it is a tool for quantifying, so actually measuring and capturing measurements about the um, observations that are being made. So not qualitative things like fizzy, bubbly, red, blue, so on, but actually measurable things. So if we're talking about blue, what is the wavelength of blue that's produced? Um, what is the time duration that that's produced? And under what temperature? Is it produced? And these are so these things are all quantifiable. And that even within a procedure, the amount of something that is added to a certain amount of something else uh, is all quantifiable. And the steps themselves are chronological. 
So math helps structure, math helps capture, and math also helps analyze and communicate because those using that level of precision uh, makes a procedure and an experiment replicable, which means that somebody can verify the results. It also uh, means that you can do many, many trials and use mathematical analysis, just basics, you know, to start with, mean, median, and mode, in order to analyze what you have um, uncovered, and then boil it down into uh, specific key data points, maybe a difference of a mean, um, where you can use that to support a claim about your hypothesis as a scientist or your prototype, whether or not it's supported, uh, whether or not it solves the problem, and you know where perhaps you need to look next or refine. So this is the foundation of these new standards, and this is what students need to be engaged in understanding and using on an everyday basis. And so in order to do that, I've seen Kentucky educators talking about, you know, trying to find an anchor activity, you know, uh, for the standard. Well, it's really that the standards are anchored in the content, and so what you need to do is find a way to make that content something that students can experience, and that they can experience as a scientist, as an engineer, actually engage in the practices, the skills. And, and use those to develop and use the content so they can observe the cross-cutting concepts and do it in a culture of critique in that classroom where it's not just a teacher critiquing as an expert, but really it's students critiquing students, bringing their differing findings forward and, and comparing and contrasting and thinking about uh, what they're seeing and whether or not certain solutions are more efficient than others, uh, looking for sources of error, looking for speculation versus evidence-based fact and reasoning. Um, those are the skills that are really useful takeaways because in, you know, the, in the entirety of the United States, um, you know, we can fill our demand for scientists and engineers with only, you know, five, six percent of the population. So teaching every student science and engineering uh, you know, equips them to think about those innovations and think about science and act as scientifically literate citizens when technology um, and laws are being developed to govern technology and its implementation in communities and so on. Um, you know, they, they need to understand that. But beyond it, having this ability to think critically and extract information and you know, develop evidence-based conclusions is something that will prove useful in every area of their life later. And that creating, evaluating, and analyzing with the next generation science standards happens simultaneously, and it should happen simultaneously in the classroom. That students should be creating, evaluating, and analyzing their own thoughts with their own thoughts. So the idea that, you know, a procedure is handed out to students or that you know, something is written on the board and students copy, the, the idea of guiding um, really needs to kind of go away. There needs to be a full release of responsibility to students. Excuse me. So the idea here is not that students run free with materials and, you know, just sort of left willy-nilly. The purpose here is that students are engaging in some nonfiction reading, for instance. They are engaging in Socratic dialogue because they have a skillful teacher that is asking higher order questions that force students to think or really respond with higher order thinking, respond by creating uh, concepts, you know, in connections between concepts in the world, concepts in themselves, concepts in other concepts, um, by evaluating their own thoughts and the thoughts of others in their class and further analyzing the claims of others and analyzing what's happening um, in that discussion as well as what perhaps they read about and then going further so that being again kind of you know 20 percent of a class that the that the real bulk of the class is then a problem or question in which those students can break into their teams and create evaluate and analyze that to solve that problem or to answer that question as a scientist or an engineer would, it requires remembering, it requires understanding, and it requires applying. But in and of itself, those 
lower order thinking skills are insufficient and um, will be mastered by focusing on the creating, evaluating, and analyzing. Uh, so that's really where uh, curriculum and instruction needs to live at this point under the new uh, Kentucky standards, just because of the way they were designed, frankly. Now, when you picture that, you can see, I hope, why taking existing curriculum a lot of times, and I'm not saying always, but many times the existing curriculum and trying to add practices in um, is really insufficient to be able to get that type of rigorous uh, instructional, next generation instructional environment um, together where it needs to be. And especially in something that has a scope and sequence which is going to cross all the strands and hit all the standards that you need to hit. Um, and really the, getting students uh, exposure to be able to master through experiencing and using uh, the practices and developing the content the way they need to. So that's you know an area that's really a lot tougher uh, for folks because in, in changes to standards past it's you know tweaking and this is you know to call this as a, a change a tweak is you know really an understatement to say the least. Um, and part of the reason for that is the traditional model of science instruction that has kind of evolved in many districts, not just in Kentucky but across the country. Um, and for, you know, it's interesting that we tend to see this being even worse, um, more entrenched at the middle school and high school level in many cases, um, in urban areas much more than in suburban or rural areas uh, in most cases, but nonetheless. The idea here is that traditional science instruction, the way that a lot of teachers are taught to teach science, they're taught to guide, they're, they're taught to tell, uh, they're taught to demonstrate and to explain and to model. And the bottom line is that what the result of that, you know, the student's role, well, you know, let's back up here for a second. In that situation, content is flowing through a teacher. And the teacher is basically handing that content out and showing it and telling it. And the student's role in that environment is to remember it. And so if a student's role is to remember it, how do they demonstrate proficiency? They demonstrate proficiency by recalling it. So basically, remembering is the lowest order of thinking. <laughs> and so if a student can memorize a definition and recall that, then they can repeat the facts, repeat the demonstration, summarize the phenomenon, and demonstrate proficiency on a standardized test or a worksheet or whatever. And that is insufficient when you consider what these next generation science standards are asking and expecting students to be able to demonstrate as a result of instruction. So this traditional model uh, is gone, at least it needs to be gone, and if it's something that you haven't let go of, um, you need to if you want to be effective, and particularly effective um, in transforming uh, uh, student learning outcomes under these next generation science standards, because the new assessments um, are not going to, uh, you know, um, essentially award credit for this type of proficiency. Um, and here's why. Because in a next generation inquiry environment, there's really a next generation model of instruction where students are developing skills and they're using those skills to develop and use the content and observe the, the system's phenomenon in action. So that's why you see this redrawn. The teacher is not between the student and the content. The teacher is not handing out the ideas. The teacher is not handing out the procedures. They're not handing out the facts and the, dem and the demonstrations and so on. The teacher is helping the student understand the expectations of the practices. They're adjusting supports. They're helping monitor and redirect students so that the student is empowered with the skills and using the skills to access the content and really learn the content and build a framework of understanding for themselves. So that's key. 
learning, what's a big piece of what has changed between these standards is why we teach science. Under previous standards, the reason we taught science fundamentally, even though if you know the website said differently, um, fundamentally the reason science was taught was so that students would know about science. Now we have engineering as part of it too. So we could say, you know, know about science and engineering, technology, math, whatever. Why we teach science now under the next generation science standards goes beyond that. It's not just that we know about science and engineering, but it's we know how to engage as scientists and engineers. We understand how uh, scientific knowledge is developed and how technology is developed. And we understand that there's a big picture where engineering and science and all the different sort of strands, earth science, space, space science, uh, life science, and so on, are all interconnected. That is why we teach science now. So it's very, very different. That means that proficiency is different as well. How a student demonstrates proficiency is by demonstrating those performance expectations in contexts that are unfamiliar to them, but that relate to those three dimensions. So performing the expectation in an environment that uh, relates to those three dimensions, or or brings together those three dimensions, and you know the wording is it's kind of tricky because uh, to visualize it really, you can imagine the example I gave you earlier about the ecosystems. You know to assess that, a student could be presented with any type of ecosystem. Could be marine, Arctic, a rocky shore, could be a desert. You know, uh, any ecosystem um, and sort of environment. And a student needs to be able to look at that and see food chains and food webs, because there are food chains and food webs that are part of every ecosystem. There are plants and animals that are a part of every ecosystem, consumers, producers, and so on, uh, decomposers. And so that's why a student's ability to generalize and synthesize is so important, and why skills are so important, and why process is so important, uh, because that's how these pieces are going to be assessed. Um, and so a student is going to be expected to be able to uh, solve problems and answer questions using those skills. They're also going to be expected to be able to describe how content interacts with other content and describe systems um, and the effects on systems when different shocks occur. So that is the goal of the curriculum and the instruction you deliver in the classroom, is to have this kind of next generation model playing out on an everyday basis. Students become experienced with the expectations, and so then they are able to perform the expectations. And when it comes around to assessments, whether it's your own assessments or the assessments at the state level, um, students are well prepared. Now. When I keep talking about these practices, there are basically at a high level eight of them. So thinking again at the classroom level, it's not just the teacher who has to have an understanding and ability to demonstrate these practices, but frankly, and more importantly, it's the students. Uh, the students need to be able to ask questions, define problems. They need to be able to understand that questions relate to science and problems relate to engineering, and there are unique processes that are attached to the two not only using a model, but developing it. Not only carrying out an investigation, but planning it. Um, not only interpreting data, but analyzing it, and so on. So mathematical thinking, designing solutions, constructing explanations, arguing from evidence. You can see the connection between those two right there. When you construct an explanation, you need to be engaging in argument from evidence. It's evidence-based reasoning. Okay. Obtaining, evaluating, communicating information. You can see the crossover right here again with math and so on. So those are the kind of tools that students need to carry with them. And then they're going to apply those tools, perhaps in the case of food chains and food webs, the way these second graders are. So these second graders have engaged in some nonfiction reading, Socratic dialogue with their class. Now at a second grade level, at least in the case, in the way that we um, have aligned our curriculum to the next generation science standards and have um, 
met the EQIP guidelines for science and the peak alignment criteria. At the lower levels, there's more structure because students are developmentally at a different level at K-1-2 than they are in grade 3 and in grade 4 and so on. So there's more structure here, but yet students are engaged in all those practices. It's just that at a different level of sophistication. And so here, students have planned their investigation, but there was some structure to help them. So they maybe didn't plan the entire investigation. They had ownership over certain aspects and used other aspects, but they saw the whole scientific process taking place and participated in it and brought their ideas to life. And they're at a phase now of carrying out that plan, gathering the data, and then they'll use that data to form an evidence-based conclusion. Once you hit fourth grade, at least in our case, Developmentally, things are in a much different place. And if you are intentionally nurturing, and I don't mean sort of you know the kindness of nurturing, we want to be kind to students, of course, but thinking about nurturing as that intentional development of skills, come fourth grade, students are able to generate plans with full release of responsibility, kind of soup to nuts from scratch. So going from a problem to an evidence-based conclusion, but they're only able to do that if they have the skills and if they have the knowledge of the processes, which is why students need um, that experience in class. You don't need to have had science and engineering in your class since kindergarten to be able to learn uh, the practices and processes in fourth grade and actually use them and develop a plan and carry out that plan from scratch. It just means that uh, your teacher needs to have that skill set in order to um, help usher you to a place of proficiency uh, with those skills and processes and an you know, understanding of the expectations of how uh, you as a student will engage that. So that's what you see going on here. So these are the like fifth grade level students engaged as engineers. They've gone through their nonfiction reading, Socratic dialogue. They've quite you know, their class has come to a problem and now they've broken into teams and this team is wrestling with that problem and I can tell by looking at the at the um, lab notebook that they have there where they are in the engineering design process. They have not seen an answer to this problem. They have some knowledge related to the problem. They have some materials that they can work with there, but they need to come up with a plan. They need to mesh their ideas. And once they have that plan together, they can use some materials, actually develop a prototype and test it, get the data, and then reflect back on whether or not it actually solves the problem. So they're actually engaging in extending technology. Or if they're in the role of science, they'd be extending scientific knowledge. Now, I'm not saying that they're doing things that people on Earth have never done before. To them, it's novel. To them, it's new and they are not repeating something that they have seen. They're not you know, doing a demonstration that was shown to them or following pictures on a card that you know, somebody bought in a curriculum you know, that was quote unquote next generation aligned and so on. Um, if something is really next generation aligned, it puts students on the forefront and forces them to think. Um, and that's what you see going on here. And in that environment, ELA, math, and science are naturally integrated. They are, um, by design, these standards were produced after the Common Core, both ELA and math, and they were designed to link up with the Common Core technical subject standards, non-fiction reading, the writing, technical writing, um, communication standards. When you think about what these students are engaging in, they're engaging in developing a nonfiction text. It's a plan. Um, they're engaged in multiple levels of process writing. Um, they're engaged in evidence-based writing. They're engaged in technical writing. So you can see it all right here just in this one picture. On the math side, Common Core math practices very closely mirror the science and engineering practices. And you, know, you see that through the data collection and the graphing and the computation and the measurement and you know, all the different things. But when we look at those Common Core math practices, you can see they fit very closely with the science and engineering practices and what we just saw in that picture. Making sense of problems, persevering and solving them, reasoning abstractly. This is directly from Common Core math, those math practices. 
constructing viable arguments, critiquing the reasoning of others. I mean, who would have thought this is all math? But in fact, it is, but it's applicable and necessary for next generation science. So, and should be happening as part of that everyday, you know, science environment, attending to precision, making use of structure, expressing repeated regularity, or regularity and repeated reasoning. And that's basically um, the idea of trials and the idea of uh, recursive steps and procedures and so on. So direct connection. In the case of ELA, like I said earlier, evidence to support analysis of text, just using uh, summarizing text distinct from prior knowledge, following precisely a multi-step procedure is actually ELA. Developing it, science standard. Following it is an ELA standard. Uh, expressing information visually, distinguishing among facts and speculation using reasoned judgment from research findings. So this is just a snapshot. There's many more. You can see how that environment comes together in the next generation science classroom in Kentucky and how those higher order thinking skills, the creating, evaluating, and analyzing that happens simultaneously is useful for all these disciplines and even others, other disciplines like uh, social studies, art, even music. and. Uh, you know, if, you're, if, if students go on to technical careers, you think about um, students going to you know, a tech program in high school and you know, creating, evaluating, and analyzing is necessary if you're going to wire a house, if you're going to put in a plumbing system, if you're going to plant a field, if you're going to try and get rid of an inv invasive species, um, if you have issues with water pollution, um, whether you're a homeowner, whether you are a parent, uh, whether you are producing food for your livestock or food for uh, customers, these skills are necessary. The way that that looks in terms of assessment, whether you're creating your own uh, or you're thinking about the Kentucky, uh, uh, the Next Generation Aligned Kentucky Assessments, is really a movement away from the kind of items you see on the left towards the kind of items you see on the right. The kind of items you see on the left are lower order thinking, just really rely on remembering. Uh, when an ice cube melts, for instance, which of its characteristics changes, if you can remember that the only thing that changes doesn't change is its mass, then you can relate that to weight and get the right answer here. Same thing number two, if you can remember that reflection means light bounces off a surface, then you're going to have no problem getting the right answer here. This is an example from the New England Common Assessment Program that is used or has been used by Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Rhode Island in the Northeast of the United States. Now, the NECAP is not considered next generation aligned because it has these lower order thinking questions. And of course, there needs to be um, some tweaks to the items that they have. But nonetheless, you can see on the right um, that students gather data and then they are looking at a scenario and asked a series of questions related to the data they gather and the scenario that they've read about. And the three dimensions can be teased out in a similar sort of way. And I want to show you, uh, well, here's an example of a scenario that would relate to what I just showed you, where in a standardized assessment, the student is you know, told about Claire and Thomas and are told about the materials they use and the hypothesis they had, the procedure they followed, and so on. Um, and that's how you get those series of questions related to a scenario. But I, again, I, as I said, this is fourth grade level. Um, I wanted to show something fourth grade. Now I want to show you something that is ne considered next generation aligned. So the uh, District of Columbia has implemented, was first in the nation to implement the um, a science assessment for grades 5, 8, and high school in biology, um, first in the country to have that statewide standardized assessment. And you know, it is District of Columbia, so it's small, but um, it's not technically a state. But nonetheless, you can see they went for a computer-based test. Um, it still has open response items. It still has multiple choice. They've added something called tech enhanced items, which means that they, you know, students can drag, drag and drop pictures into an order. Okay, but it's familiar, and these are the different performance expectations that students are going to be expected to perform. So, 
what does it look like? It looks like this. Again, a scenario. Again, a procedure. There's some tweaks that need to be made to this because this procedure is not labeled properly, but nonetheless, it is a procedure. The point I want to make is that the student who's taking this test is asked whose claim is correct, Trevor or Kayla. Trevor or Kayla are the fictional students in the scenario, each who make their own claims, which are opposing. The real student who is taking the test is asked to explain why Kayla or Trevor's claim is correct and use evidence to support that choice. So they have to look at this, analyze the claims of others, extract data from the data tables, actually analyze it, evaluate it, and construct or create their own answer based on their own opinion, based on the data and analysis that they have done of the scenario and of the data and of the claims. This is how next generation assessments are higher order. Okay, It's how those standards come to life in an assessment. And frankly, when teachers are doing their job in the classroom, when districts are doing their job in the classroom by supporting that kind of next generation inquiry environment, this sort of scenario you know, is not a, it, it, Trevor and Kayla are the real children in your classroom. And they're having these ideas. And they're coming up with a way to make something. And they are testing it. And they're gathering, da gathering data about it. So in, in this case, you have fictional students. Right? Now imagine that those are real students. They're your students. And they are developing this for themselves the way that Trevor and Kayla did. And instead of coming to these um, conclusions that are unsupported, your students would actually be coming to conclusions that are supported and are reasoned from evidence. And that evidence is the evidence that they collected. Okay, So you can think about this as a statewide standardized assessment model, or you can think about this as an assessment model for your classroom. But it displays to us, really, when we think about replacing you know, fictional students with real students, how students should be learning in the classroom as well. These next generation assessments are thematic. They tell a story. And that story, you can see Trevor and Kayla again in these items. Okay, This is a tech enhanced item where they can drag and drop on the computer. But yet there's still a constructed response where students have to explain, identify what the shortest path for energy is in this food web. On the right, you have a multiple choice. But you know what? Being able to eliminate the wrong answers isn't good enough because, or at least eliminating one or two, because now you can see here students are asked to select three correct answers. They're given a food chain. And so a student has to look at this basically as a scenario, be able to apply their knowledge of the systems that exist within ponds, within food chains. And also, when you look at the second part of this, they have to be able to use that model of the, po the pond food chain to describe the relationship between the organisms in that chain and how the matter is exchanged back into the environment. So similar to what I mentioned earlier, that means that a student needs to be able to look at something like a minnow, and if a minnow is half eaten by a perch or dies or whatever, that whatever remains in the pond is going to be returned. Its matter is going to be returned into this food chain by that bacteria. So there's actually another food chain that's here. And in fact, that's part of a life cycle. And so a student has to be able to put that together using their skills, using their knowledge, using their understanding of how systems, what systems exist and how they exist in ponds, okay, and what those relationships are like. That's why effective STEM instruction and the definition we get from the National Research Council, which underpins all these new standards, and we've had it for a while, is a movement from what you see in that picture on the left to what you see in the picture on the right. It's not about you know, the teacher expert showing every student how to do something and then watching every student do it. What it's about is students being released with their responsibility, being challenged with a problem or question that they then have to collaborate with a peer you know, 
hopefully they're collaborating with peers because that's a 21st century skill, but you know, they at least on their own need to be able to uh, wrestle with that problem or that question and progress from it extending, using what they know and extending it forward into a place that they don't know so that they do that kind of methodically gathering data which can be verified because they've documented a plan and then using the data that they collect to reflect back on their own idea. That's why we see you know, what's on the right as being um, so effective and valuable and actually impacting you know, standardized testing and engagement and all these sort of different things. But I'll read this definition to you quickly. So effective science instruction capitalizes on students' early interests and experiences. That means it starts in pre-K, pre kindergarten, and follow, you know, follows students all the way through high school. Identifies and builds on what they know. So again, it's intentionally nurturing K-12, but also September through June. So there's a, a storyline, a, a nurturing process that's happening here. Concepts are scaffolding, and it's providing students with the experiences to engage in the practices of science and sustain their interest. So what that means is that students are, um, you know, the word practices is very intentional, that students are applying the tools the science and engineering practices within the classroom in order to experience the concepts, in order to experience the phenomenon, in order to use it and extend it. And that uh, direct involvement of the student, you know, I shouldn't say involvement, um, it's, you know, the student is the driver here. Um, they're not passive or following, but they're actively pursuing uh, with these skills, that's what sustains the student's interest. So having a rigorous scope and sequence is really difficult right now because teachers in Kentucky are wrestling with trying to create one unit that works and one lesson that works uh, to do this. And what they really need to do is create an entire storyline of many lessons that connect throughout the year. And in fact, they need to be collaborating vertically so that the lessons of one year actually connect to the lessons of another year. So uh, that's challenging, and I almost liken it to thinking that, you know, these new standards are a dramatic innovation. Um, an innovation like the arch was to architecture thousands of years ago. Nobody created an arch, um, sort of this dry stone arch, until the sort of Roman times, and the reason was that nobody, you know, everybody had been kind of building things by stacking things like bricks, one on top of the other. Uh, and an arch only stands when the arch is complete. And so one of the problems with even the way that people are being coached to uh, you know, pursue these new standards, the reality of it is, is that you know, nothing really works well until it's complete, until you really have a complete curriculum system together, until your um, you know, vocabulary is consistent through all your grade levels and you know people are referring to things by the same definitions and that your concepts are scaffolding within the grade level so that they're building and students are able to see the connections and make the connections and those dialogues are really robust and until the experiences hands-on in the classroom are actually engaging students thinking at that higher level, the creating, evaluating, and analyzing, engaging them and it's rigorous enough to cross through all of the different concepts and contexts that you need to in order to um, get students to a mastery level with those standards. So that's, I think, the greatest challenge. It's kind of chicken or egg. Um, and it's something that people have never done before because education has sort of evolved really, and that's the word for it, evolved, it has iterated, and it has done so slowly. And in this case, um, nothing is, you know, the idea that students can ask questions or, you know, identify problems, it's nothing new about that. But the idea that they're doing it in a context with content, and they're developing it as a skill so that they can actually, uh, you know, wrestle with a problem and, and work methodically to a solution and so on. That's really new. People don't do that. People haven't done that a wide scale uh, within education. And so that's been sort of the Achilles heel of 
of STEM, of science, technology, engineering, and math. Because we haven't done that K-12, that's why we need these standards. Um, that's why we don't get as many students pursuing science careers. Um, it's, they view it as something that they have to follow, and remembering something technical when you don't have a framework of understanding that you're building along the way is difficult. So, you know, people say, I don't, you know, math isn't my thing. Um, well, it can be your thing, but it's only going to be your thing if you have a framework of understanding um, that you've built through experiencing and basically needing those concepts versus being shown them and trying to remember them. Um, but nonetheless, so when you think about the kind of resources that are available right now, they kind of fall into four categories. Awareness resources are the lowest level, the kind of one, two page lesson plan curriculum kind of things where, you know, as a result, you get, you know, from some lesson plan, you can get a, a hundred different potential lessons um, because they're so kind of generic and, and vague in terms of the, um, what it's asking for. The other side, so you know, at that level, it's making a teacher kind of aware of the general area of what they need to be doing. But at the student's level, the uh, awareness type resources are the kind you get from museums, download off the internet, again, kind of one, two pitch sort of things. Companies will offer them, um, and I mean companies like STEM companies. The, the piece of that is that an awareness ready resource is something that only gets students to the point of really understanding the basics of, you know, engineers solve problems. So, okay, if I ask you what an engineer is, you can raise your hand and tell me, you know, they solve a problem. It doesn't mean that a student really knows all about what engineers have discovered. We think about that as a knowledge-ready sort of thing where students become, you know, knowledgeable about what scientists and engineers have done. That's what kind of a textbook traditionally has fit. And so um, knowledge-ready resources are things like textbooks. And you can imagine that the things I've been describing to you in these next generation science standards are not the kind of things that you can learn out of a textbook. Um, they can't really be explained. And if you struggle to understand some of my explanations, you can see exactly how hard it is to explain something which is really fundamentally something that you have to experience and observe and build a framework of understanding around. So when you go a bit further, you come to things like performance readiness, which is learning how to perform task when prompted for it, in essence. So that's something that kits oftentimes do, where you know, if you learn that rocks have different levels of hardness, you want to know how hard a rock is, just do a hardness test. And so you know, in your kit, you have things, and students fill in the blank to you know, find the hardness of different rocks and minerals um, by scratching them on different types of surfaces. That's performance readiness. So unless the students ask that specific question, it has very limited value. Mastery readiness is what we aim for, but it's really what the standards are aiming for. Mastery readiness is all about a skill set that you can apply to answer any problem or any question using the knowledge you have or, or knowledge that you can find and you have the skills to find it really um, or develop it through an experiment and that's where the planning comes in. So something that's mastery, you know, readiness level is a student being thrown into a, an environment or a scenario where they are asked about a pond ecosystem and perhaps there is an invasive species of weed or fish or turtle that's in there and perhaps it's you know, causing trouble, um, whether it's wiping out or endangering certain species or perhaps somehow endangering people or livestock. So in that scenario, a student would need perhaps to use their science and engineering practices to look at different possible ways that are known to eliminate this uh, invasive species and really um, make an evidence-based recommendation, really reason out why a farmer should use a herbicide or why they should engage a predatory species or so on. So um, thinking about that and then thinking about the implications of what uh, happens when turtles become overpopulated or underpopulated. What happens when the turtles, that invasive species is removed entirely? Does it actually 
destroy other aspects of the um, you know of the ecosystem or food chain or food web. So that's mastery level readiness. So far beyond kits. The um, connection to art that I wanted to make is that the kind of skills we're talking about, those creative, evaluative, and analytical skills, the culture of critique that we create in our classroom, is all skills that are common to artists, whether they are painters, musicians, whatever. Those um, skills are how artists engineer communication because that's what art really is. It's engineered communication. It's a statement in a medium that's not verbal. And that's why you know art uh, consists of dance and music and sculpture and painting and you know other areas. And that's why when people think of art as making things pretty or the aesthetics, they are doing themselves a disservice. Um, when you think about artists, artists have been persecuted <laughs> worldwide for ever. <laughs> and um, it's because they make statements. And sometimes those statements are unpopular. Sometimes they're popular. Sometimes they're unpopular. Um, sometimes they're unnoticed. But what they're doing is they're engineering communication. And I use this example of Guernica by Pablo Picasso because it's, he and this work are perhaps the most widely known uh, at least, you know, uh, in the United States, um, but perhaps in the world. And yet this is, you know, his most famous work, and it's not particularly aesthetically pleasing. Um, it's not colorful and, you know, so on and so forth, but it's making a statement. Um, and it is in his particular aesthetic, an aesthetic being sort of a style of the way he would draw. But the point I want to make here is that he was living in exile when he created this. He um, was doing it to make a statement about the atrocities at Guernica, a particular place in Spain, um, and Spain being his his native land. Uh, the, these atrocities were being committed by the fascists. And so when he was commissioned to produce this work for the international exposition, uh, he was making a statement to the fascists and to the world about the atrocities, that they were known and that they were atrocious. And so uh, that was unpopular with the fascists. And they came to him and they said, what did you do? And as the story goes, he said, I didn't do it, but you did. And so you can see that it was very intentional. And that was the reason why he needed to live in exile, um, not just because of this work, but because of the type of statements and the communication um, that his work represented. And that's why great artists get in trouble a lot of times. Um, doesn't mean they have to get in trouble, but it means that they are targeting communication specific audiences. And sometimes what they say is unpopular with those audiences. And so when you think about developing these skills in students, there are connections to art. Um, you're making students better producers of art and consumers of art when they realize that art is engineered communication. And you think about English language arts, and you think about people like Dickens. Dickens could have given money to the poor, but instead he wrote a book, uh, many books um, about poverty. But you think about something like A Christmas Carol and how that contribution of his work, that statement, um, touches people so broadly, religious and not religious, about the plight of the poor and wealth inequality and um, and really moves people um, to take action, even still today, many, many, many years later. And so um, to engage in the arts, whether they're English language arts or otherwise, and to ignore that fact is doing a disservice to the discipline. But it's also underutilizing um, and it needs to utilize these skills which we are developing in science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, so if you think that you know engineers make cars and artists make them pretty, you're missing out. Um, you know engineers may design cars, but the art is how that car actually connects with a particular buyer, and the reason that somebody chooses, perhaps for a non-technical reason, but uh, to engage that car as a symbol, perhaps, of wealth or a symbol of industrious or hardworking nature, as you might think of certain trucks. Um, very key, subtle but important. 
thinking about how curriculum professional development and materials come together, they have to come together like hand and glove. Whether you create them yourself, whether you um, you know, knit them together from different resources you find, or whether you come to someone like us at No Adam and you know, try to uh, adopt what we have available. And you're welcome to take a look at that. We have free samples online of curriculum and resources uh, you know, on the teacher side and on the student side. You just go to noatom.com, K-N-O-W-A-T-O-M, and look at the top of the page. It'll say STEM curriculum, and you can scroll down. There's resources there. You can see samples of one month of content for grades one through eight. And uh, you know, professional development is necessary to help teachers understand this next generation model of instruction, teaching and learning on both sides. And the materials, really, the hands-on parts, you know, th those exist as well. You know, all these pieces exist to allow students to be able to engage hands-on and actually be put in that role of scientist and engineer and extend their knowledge. And again, not uh, you know, paint by number, follow by number. You know, we don't think by number, um, but in fact, actually engage in the practices and the processes and come to some place that is novel, but reflecting their ideas. What that looks like in the data, um, and I'll just take one quick second to do this, show you some data, is that uh, the students, in our case anyways, are performing even under non-NGSS aligned testing above state averages, upwards of 20 and even 30 percent in some cases. When you look at um, places like New Hampshire, their standardized assessment, the NECAP, is not next generation aligned, but these sort of practices have students who use our curriculum in uh, purple and in yellow in each of these categories. You see these are the only categories that they are outperforming those state averages, which are in pink and in teal. And with increasing by increasing amounts, when you look at the purple being year one and yellow being year two, so on. In places like Massachusetts, you see the same sort of thing. Even in environments where 35% of the children don't speak English, 72% are low income, 75% are high needs, you can see the state average is only 50%. And this school has a positive trend, and they have almost doubled nearly 90% advanced and proficient in 2012. And there are ups and downs. That's part of life. Um, there are changes in teachers, which have happened here, and administration. But nonetheless, to be above state average and, in fact, increasing year over year, and, in fact, nearly doubling, doubling the state average is quite impressive. In environments where there are uh, is less need, you know, only 7% low income, 20% high need, you see more stability. Um, you see that change happen, you know, dramatically at the beginning and maintain. And so, again, a place where the average is 50%, schools are performing at the 80th, 80% uh, proficient and advanced. Similar case here. Okay, this is the number one in Massachusetts, as an example, um, who also use our curriculum. Students performing at 90% advanced and proficient, barely any students with any level of the lowest tier of warning or failing. And even in some of the most difficult uh, middle schools, you see going from 4% proficient to 28% over the course of two and a half years. So, and by the way, this school is now at the level of its peers in other cities. So the 26 largest cities in Massachusetts, when you average them, these, um, these students are now at that level. They need to progress beyond that, but they were, you know, bottom of the barrel to start. So nonetheless, um, and you can see, again, a difficult environment to that school, 95% low income, 87% free lunch, 97% uh, high needs. So I won't uh, mention any more data, but you can see that it's uh, particularly powerful and gives evidence that even under testing that's not aligned, like the normed testing that was going on in Kentucky, um, you can see dramatic gains. There's a second part of this series which it really talks more in depth about what these resources have to, you know, what they look like and how you strategically implement them. And you can check that out at noadam.com forward, forward slash strategically. Um, if you have any questions about our resources, if you've been downloading them or checking any of that out, um, you're you know, welcome to reach out about that. If you have questions about anything on this webinar, you can reach out by phone, um, by email, mdelisi at noadam.com or the phone number you have here. And uh, if you have a question for me, feel free to you know, forward that along as well. There are a few other resources that um, you can engage in for free. We hope you'll stay connected by our blog. Um, you can subscribe for free. 
facebook.com forward slash noadam or Twitter, follow us at noadam. You can get those uh, curriculum and reader samples, noadam.com forward slash curriculum, and you can look more at some of this data if you'd like, um, noadam.com forward slash results. There are additional free and live on-demand resources at noadam.com forward slash resources. I've enjoyed the opportunity to speak with you, and I wish you luck as you implement the next generation of Kentucky Science Standards in your districts and in your classrooms. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.